a look at this question that you have to answer in the next few days. Uh, it's a question I purposely picked from the last few um, paragraphs of Carson and Moo. Uh, the idea being uh, really a summary from their standpoint of First Peter in its largest segments. And I want to change that and look at it to make it interesting to you that the study that you will do has absolute relevance for what's going on in today's political world because it's a way in which Peter seeks to frame the existence of Christianity not from a hyper individualistic standpoint in the way that we understand Christianity in other words uh, which uh, organization we go to which denomination that we're a part of which small group and so forth and how we align ourselves like that um, Peter is looking at it in a different way he's looking at it in, in a sort of a, a cosmopolitan whole if I can put it in modern terms like that you can see that from the first few verses where he lists all those places in Galatia and Bithynia and so forth that are basically existent in modern day Turkey and Asia Minor and as he's writing to those uh, people he's writing to them from the standpoint of seeing them as part of one great whole and not individual members and not individual uh, congregations that exist separately but in some sense as a whole uh, from that standpoint I think you can see that in the first few verses and it's very very um, uh, powerfully presented by Peter and the background to it is that he's writing to people who exist in another complete whole the other complete whole if I can use it like that in that sense is the existence of the Roman Empire it doesn't seem like that he's writing out of a uh, perspective of the persecutions under Nero or those under later on under Domitian uh, in, uh, eight, uh, in the 80s and so forth um, it, it seems that the, there's a prospect of um, rejection certainly that could lead to uh, martyrdom or uh, be put to death for your beliefs but it's more it appears to be a rejection by society of who these people are so what Peter is doing is then he's he's in a sense balancing two elements uh, I'm going to use the words that he uses when he calls the uh, Christians and I use that word uh, properly because it's really apart from uh, the book of Acts it's the only place where it's actually used uh, and used in a very positive sense in the context of defining a culture of people the Christian people who undergo suffering chapter 4 and so from their standpoint he is then describing I'll use other words now uh, he's describing what he calls a holy nation uh, that is very interesting because the nation that he is um, writing about or conflicting with is the the Roman Empire nation in other words the political power and sovereignty that Rome has over all these places where Peter is living and where at the same time all his um, uh, congregations he's writing to exist under the power and might of the Roman Empire so from that standpoint what we've got now are, are, are two entities you might say the the Roman culture with all that goes along with it and then the Christian culture that's set side by side and I think that one of the first things that you should do is that you should go through first Peter and identify those two areas 
um, highlight or underline, preferably I would think it'd be best to print out um, the pages of First Peter and then take a, a red pen or a, a yellow highlighter and in, in red, highlight all those statements versus any connection that has to do with the empire because that's the context through which uh, Peter's theology of Christ is going to be expressed and it's going to be expressed theoretically and practically as we shall see now with the other pen then I think you should go through and highlight all the uh, texts that specifically make a, a reference to some to to another nation, uh, a, a a priesthood, a a, a massive uh, group of people that he's writing uh, to, and be careful. And it that might be a bit difficult because you might say, well, all of it is written to these people. Yes. But identify them as much as you can. The words like a holy nation, a priesthood, the uh, uh, spiritual house that's being built in chapters two and three, uh, whether that's a house that Peter is using as a metaphor, or most probably as Job uh, infers it, he's referring to a temple uh, and he's drawing off his Jewish tradition. Now, that's another thing, too is then once you've done that and you've got those two elements together then you now have a separation then between what I'd call two cultures and then what you can do is um, at least be aware of the context that Peter's writing and I say that in a twofold way in the first way he's writing as a Jewish Christian and so therefore he's going to use terminology that comes straight out of that background you can see that in chapter one with a reference to the prophets and what they spoke about what they knew you can see that in respect to the idea of a nation or a priesthood or the blood of christ all of that has connotations that give him the, uh, well, not just connotations, that give him a background in theology in which he's going to give his answer to the conflict between the what I would call the two nations or the two uh, territories, so to speak. The, um, the, the, the church, the priesthood, the holy nation, and the empire itself. And so from that standpoint, then, he's got the raw material and what he's going to do then is to use the um, uh, the most distinctive element of what Christianity is about. In other words, he's not writing like somebody who's uh, a Zig Ziglar uh, writing positive thinking for people. So he reduces everything to behavior, put away all malice, do all this, etc. Treat people like this, etc. And be the sort of sort of what we would call in today's civic society a nice person he's not he's not doing that at all he is talking about specific behavior uh, as you can see the household code that's mentioned there the element of um, what husbands and wives and slaves should be doing in respect to how they should act and even on a wider sense on how christians should act uh, in respect to local government and even the emperor himself when he says honor the emperor so he he he, he then uh, that's why I say where well, this is extremely practical in what he's saying he gives the big picture and then dives into it and specifies practical relational elements that these people who are Christians will come across now when I say the foundational element uh, of what will what Peter will apply to the two entities, the holy nation, the church, and the nation, uh, i.e., the emperor, emperor, and the empire, is uh, he's going to then take what he calls at the end of um, it's the end of chapter one. I can't, can't quite remember chapter one or chapter two. 
where he talks about the word of God. And he says, this is the word that's being preached to you. Uh, it's the word that has um, given you then the fact that you are now born again. And he has a, other connotations in respect to that born again situation, as we'll see in chapter three, with the element um, of baptism. Um, and he does it in such a way then to know that, that well, if you're a Protestant, that would immediately appeal to you in terms of the word of God. Here, not so much in, in written form, although Peter's letter, of course, does become the word of God as it's included in the canon. But the word of God in respect to the word that was preached. And the question is, what was the word that was preached? Well, it was the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the fact that his sacrifice was a vicarious fact, sacrifice on our behalf that freed us from um, the uh, separation from God and has given us the forgiveness of sins and the confidence to approach God. So in that sense, you could say he's entirely Pauline. He's, he works off the same canvas as Paul, but he does it in a different way because the problems he's got as he approaches then this uh, conflict between the church and the um, uh, Roman Empire is written in what? It, it is a letter, there's no doubt about that. But at the same time, it's, it's a letter in a sense written to a group of churches, perhaps in a way that uh, Ephesians is when Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, but he, he's writing uh, to a, gr a number of uh, churches that are in the Ephesian area around, around Ephesus. And here, uh, Peter's doing the same thing. So he's got a very, very large expanse. So the third thing then that I'm saying is that, that the, the key that Peter will uh, assess the Roman Empire and the place of Christians in it is through the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that whatsoever. And now uh, I say this is entirely re relevant when you think about it, because we live in a nation in which many people at this moment are thoroughly convinced of the two entities that exist together. In other words, uh, uh, the United States of America uh, as a Christian nation, starting back with the Puritans and the arrival of the Mayflower and taking that um, and then um, creating a history. I, I want to use the word mythologized, mythologized history because the early settlers were not uh, uh, Protestant Christians as they grew in number, as we would like to think they are. But from that standpoint, they were. They were Christians who originally came here. And so the, the idea of quickly developed, as you know, I'm sure you know well from your own history, that the United States was established as a new Israel. It's a new destiny, a destiny of a people who leave behind their old ways uh, in Europe and begin new traditions in the United States based upon God's favor because he's planted them in a new land, the promised land. Uh, and that's been advocated throughout American history and is very, very strong at this moment in the way that uh, many, many millions, I think, of Christians see the United States of America as having a special place in God's plan of redemption and therefore having to deal with the conflict of what's the difference between the ethics that we Christians live by in the United States and the state itself and what it functions as and how does it function on what basis where are its principles? Are they Christian principles? Can they become more Christian principles? Can we marry ourselves to the state in such a way that we can be satisfied that we're living as Christians and at the same time advocating a statehood that's a duality, uh, uh, 
that uh, as one, for example, it's one of the flags that we've often seen on or heard people talk about in the media is uh, Trump is my president, but Jesus is my savior. That was you know, when Trump was president or, or thinking that he will be again in 2024. What does that mean? It means that there is at least a conflict that's going on in people's minds and in the culture uh, 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 as a whole of seeing a particular person as an embodiment of the cultural values and having a place under Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, probably the statement arose because there's some sort of conflict in the sense that uh, uh, a president of that ilk assumes a, a place before God that is in line with who God is. Now, I'll give you one more example. The other example is what's going on in the Ukraine at the moment with uh, the um, um, a cosmopolitan um, uh, chief of the Orthodox Church in Russia, Kirill, who is in line completely with what President Putin is doing, or vice versa. Um, and what Putin has done is he's aligned himself with the church that goes back to uh, an individual who's a prince called Vladimir, who became the first saint, Vladimir the first, who's baptized in uh, 988. And he became then the, uh, the sort of uh, uh, patron, the embodiment of what a spiritual R Russia would be. And the Russia extended its uh, boundaries, as we see ultimately in the Soviet Union. And Putin is doing the same in the sense of at least recapturing elements and bringing them under the control of Rush. Uh, or Rus, as it was originally, I believe, in the language it referred to what we call Russia. But there, of course, I'm referring to the Soviet Union. So that Putin sees then the proper extremities, at least uh, in minimal form, of being Russia, Belarus, and the Ukraine at this present time. And probably he's got aspirations for more, Moldova, Romania, Estonia, Latvia, and so on. Um, but the idea is that Kirill, the um, spiritual force of the nation, is actually sanctioned the invasion of the Ukraine. And that means that then the soldiers who are going into the Ukraine, who are then part of uh, the, the Orthodox Church or brought up uh, uh, under the unity of the church in the nation are seeing themselves, we could say, as followers of Jesus in some sense. And that what the Archbishop who said this recently uh, re uh, referred to the, the soldiers as uh, uh, basically fulfilling holy work in what they're doing in eradicating the leadership of uh, Ukraine, in which they've demonized as what uh, neo-Nazis and drug addicts. So I've given you two examples there of the, of the problem that's occurred that is our problem. It's my problem and it's your problem. I could go into my own background, uh, being English, of how the, the British Empire did exactly the same thing in the 19th and early part of the 20th century by using Christianity as a basis to establish civilization all over Africa, uh, India, and of course tried in the United States, but failed uh, uh, several hundred years ago. So now then, how does Peach, I'm sorry, that was a bit of a, that was a bit of cul-de-sac, but I said it so that you can see when you've done this study, I'm hoping that it will give you information for your own uh, personal understanding and development of thinking in respect to what um, your place is as a Christian living in the United States when you're asked to do certain things. So that, for example, uh, if, uh, if you have children in the next uh, 15 years, 20 years, and the United States is called on to, have, uh, to go to war, will your child, will you advocate your child going to war? Uh, 
uh, under what basis? Well, the first thing we have to accept here, what Peter is saying, and he grounds them in it, he grounds them in the fact that these people are absolutely different. In other words, they are different in two ways. One, they're different because they've been changed from the inside. They've been changed from the inside by being a due sister and being born again and have given themselves to Christ. And I think it's very important here. I didn't bring this out when I, I mentioned the, the two highlights of what you should do with the red and the yellow, but perhaps take another color, maybe purple or blue or whatever. And I think you should go through the elements in um, the letter that bring out a theology of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, because um, it's extremely strong. Uh, and I think you should just highlight that so you can see what Peter draws upon. He does it especially in uh, chapter 2, verse 21 following. But really, you can find it really throughout the whole letter. I've just gone through it myself and, and, and looked at, you can see it in, in chapter 1, verse 3, and then verse uh, 9, and then verse 19 of chapter 1, where it refers to the, the, the Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God, who is to be sacrificed. In other words, the idea of sacrifice, which goes back, as you know, to uh, Isaiah 53, is very strong, which is brought out in chapter 2, 21 through 25, especially in the sense that that sacrifice was a vicarious way of atoning for our own sins. He bore our sins on the cross. Chapter 3, verse 18, similarly. And then chapter 4, verse 12, and chapter 5, verse 1, he moves there from the uh, ontological status of the fact that we're now Christians to the fact that with the, when we are also to suffer, for Christ and you suffer for verse 12 as a Christian uh, and the shepherds the leaders of the congregations they're also to be uh, commended as they're an example to the congregation and to expect suffering themselves so then there's an application in a twofold way in the way that Peter um, uh, gives the church its direction number one it's founded each one is founded, each individual, each congregation, all of them are founded upon the basis of Jesus Christ dying for our, their sins on the cross. That's, that, that's, that's the first thing. And the second thing is then Peter uses that to establish what you might call an imitation of Christ. In other words, you are now, because of Jesus and his suffering on the cross, you must expect suffering too. And when you suffer, you are making up in some form, and Paul, this comes out in Paul very strong, you're making up the sufferings of Christ. And that therefore, is now you can't separate those two elements. You can't make Jesus, as actually someone tried to tell me the other day, that Jesus' death and resurrection was really a martyrdom and that we are to imitate his life of, it, of going through suffering, i.e. death, to achieve what we will be given after death. Now, that, what that misses out is the main component that Peter's talking about here, which is the death of Christ uh, as the Paschal Lamb, to use Paul's terminology, or just use lamb, that's, that's Peter's terminology, uh, the, in the sense that our relationship with God is now established because of what Jesus has done. Now, then he takes that. This is the really exciting thing. It's, first of all, he sees there is a separation between the, that culture, the existent culture, and the culture that he wants to inculcate in the members. The separation is, um, uh, is then... Uh, addressed from the standpoint of 
The foundation of our Christianity is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because of that, then we have to live as a certain way. Number one, you are a polis. The word polis uh, in Greek is, means city. And city, uh, it's actually larger than a city. To use Peter's term, you're a, you're a, a nation, right? Uh, uh, as a nation, then you're a political entity. Now, uh, that means then that the church is a political entity as he understands it, because he's seeing the canvas as the Roman Empire as one entity and the church as another entity. And they're, they're against one another, not in a violent state at this point, although the Christians with their culture are coming into great difficulties with the Roman culture itself. They're being abused, ridiculed, um, insulted, and so forth. And Peter gives them the way that the Christians should respond in that culture. And he does it um, uh, individually um, from the standpoint of even down, one of my favorite scriptures is uh, 1 Peter 3, 15, when, when he says, let everyone be prepared to give an answer inside of him or herself about the hope that lies within them. That, that in one sense, makes every Christian a sort of an, a, an apologist or an evangelist, um, but not in, a, in, an, in an, a, an aggressive way and not in a way of the um, uh, functions that were given of evangelists and prophets and so on. In other parts of the New Testament, as in um, Ephesians or in First Corinthians, but from a standpoint of every single believer, then having something to say when they are abused and ridiculed, and when they are abused and ridiculed, the believer will take solace in the fact: number one, that Christ Himself suffered, and you can look again at those if you've marked those passages in purple. Uh, or blue or whatever, you can see how Peter applies the death, burial, and resurrection in terms of the suffering of Christ to help alleviate the problems of accepting and being able to tolerate the sufferings for these Christians. And the, the so in other words, that's the first thing. The second thing is that he grounds them even further by saying, you're a different entity anyway. You're, you're, you've, you've had a new birth. You're in a new nation, a new people. And the way that he describes that in chapter 3, which is a very problematic passage uh, in the latter part of chapter 3, but the, the simple element of it is through baptism. In other words, you have your own institution. You might say, just like the United States has its own institutions of uh, 4th of July and so forth, and uh, Thanksgiving holidays. Well, the Christian, what Peter is saying, he has his or her own beginning point that is celebrated, that establishes him or herself in this holy nation, the what we call the church. Don't think of the church as a, a group of you know, 5,000 denominational Protestant bodies. Think of the way Peter is describing the church here as a whole. And in the sense of him, when he says in verse 18, I think of chapter 3, where he says, baptism now saves you. Just like there was a separation between Noah uh, and his family and those who are outside of the ark. You might say there are two cultures there. The culture of being on the ark and being the people of God, as opposed to the culture of being really dying in the waters. Uh, that's the ungodly culture that God in Genesis 6 was seeking to eradicate. In the same way, you've been born again, number one, by the word of God, end of uh, uh, chapter 1. And that word is defined as the message that was preached. And that is further defined as the preached message being the content of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And from that standpoint, then, that's why he can agree with elements of the state that are um, make the residents, make the Christians who are resident aliens, as he calls them, compatible with the state. 
honor the emperor. And then even slaves obey your masters, uh, wives obey your husbands, husbands treat yourself in this way. Now, the key to that is not to think of it in terms of, of the, he's endorsing the culture that exists. What he's doing is he's accepting the culture that exists. He doesn't think that the best way to actually change that culture is through um, a way of uh, um, overcoming it through through violence or um, um, nonviolent revolution in the sense of going against the social mores of that culture. Rather, what he does, though, is he encourages the Christians to be obedient in that culture but he does it not from the standpoint of the ethics or morals or standing of that culture, but from, he draws all of it from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So that then you are to honor the emperor um, for the Lord's sake. The example that's given of um, slaves obeying their masters and uh, wives uh, obeying their husbands is drawn right out of the teachings of the Lordship of Jesus. Uh, and we might not agree with it as we look from the 19th century in respect to what happened in 1832 with the eradication of slavery in Britain. But uh, in Peter's case, what he's doing is he is undercutting that society, but he's undercutting it in the way that in the long road worked, and that is that it comes from the transformation of individuals who are um, born again and given a new way of life, a new ethic, which is to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, accepting his uh, death, burial, and resurrection as the basis of forgiveness of sins, and living in that culture, being part of it and being separate from it and using it to the best degree that you can. Now, so in other words, finally then, I've given you those three elements and the task of the essays, you read the topic carefully then, is to see how they interconnect with each other and what Peter as a, an apostle is saying to the church at large on how you are to handle the interplay between culture. And the last thing I would say practically as you write this is I want you to think about how then does that connect our culture and what's been said about Christianity and our nation in respect to how we should think from First Peter. Okay, thanks.